Okay. So uh, yesterday we have seen the optical property of uh, uh, of snow and ice, spectral reflectance of snow and ice. And I ask you a couple of questions. I hope you would uh, really dwell on that to uh, to make it uh, easier for you to understand today's talk. So uh, today we will talk about the development of algorithm. Uh, many of you uh, who are working in the field of remote sensing are quite familiar with the idea of algorithm uh, because algorithm is uh, nothing but uh, you, you prepare a finite list of instructions um, uh, for a computer and then calculate a function. Uh, so in this particular context, our function is a snow cover. So, uh, so if you really want to estimate the snow cover, uh, it is necessary for us to estimate in comparison with other land features. And uh, other land features, if you really have a snow cover, is a vegetation because many times there will be a lot of snow on vegetation or, or below the vegetation. Then there will be rock, soil, and water. And these are the uh, fundamental uh, land features which will be there. So we should be able to differentiate snow uh, from these features. So uh, we can do it um, if you if you have a unique unique spectral reflectance bands and uh, information. Mm. Uh, so what it, it normally in satellite remote sensing, if you are using then you should use a band or combination of band. They can then uh, you can estimate uh, snow. So many of you are aware that uh, if you have ever worked on the raw satellite data, then raw, raw satellite data is nothing but the digital number. So we will go to that. But the question which you ask yourself is, can we use the digital number to uh, to do the further analysis? Uh, but um, we will we will explore that issue a little bit later on. But keep that in mind. And uh, we have seen this curve yesterday, and in this curve we have seen that mm, snow has a very high reflectance in a visible ba band of electromagnetic spectrum. That means around 500, 400 nanometers to 700 or 800 nanometers. 700 nanometers, it has very high reflectance in this region. And when it comes to the sea region, that means 1500 to 1700, 1550 to 1750 nanometers, snow has very low reflectance. So this is by any means very unique uh, characteristic, uh, a very unique reflectance. Uh, so, key question is, uh, can we use, exploit this typical characteristic of snow cover where it has very high reflectance in one satellite band and very low reflectance in another satellite band. But it is also necessary for us to understand what is the reflectance curve in other land features. And uh, so if you look into the other, like ice, if you look into the ice, then what happens is ice also has very high reflectance in a, in a, in a uh, visible spectrum, and it has low reflectance in a near infrared spectrum uh, or a sphere spectrum. Uh, and same story in contaminated snow. But when it comes to, um, comes to the rock or soil, then you can see that uh, soil has a low reflectance in visible spectrum and very high reflectance in sphere. Uh, and if it comes to the vegetation, vegetation also has a low reflectance in visible and, and relatively higher reflectance in sphere band. So there is a possibility that uh, we should uh, have a unique, um, uh, a unique uh, observation here where Snow reflectance characteristics are unique if you combine the visible and sphere part of 
electromagnetic spectrum. But if it is really a uh, really a satellite images, uh, and if it has very high reflectance, so this is RF P3 with the imagery, which is invisible and sphere region of spectrum, you can you, you notice the difference in tone uh, of snow due to different reflectance characteristics. So you can see here that uh, snow has very high reflectance and white invisible part of spectrum, and the same snow when it comes to the uh, uh, when it comes to the uh, uh, near uh, sphere region, it has very low reflectance, indicating that um, uh, clearly indicating that uh, uh, this is reflected. The reflectance is reflected in a tone of satellite images. So this is very, uh, very important observations you can make. So you can you can really do the simple scatter plot uh, to understand uh, what is the uh, giving uh, giving the reflectance of a major land features. If you plot it, then you can see here that you have a sphere band, which is the reflectance and green band, which is, a, which is another reflectance. So snow supposed to have high reflectance in green band and sphere and low reflectance. So it, it occupies this space. Uh, another is a cloud, which is uh, occupying another space. Then this is ice, which is occupying close. Then there is a, um, a rock, which is at different place, and the vegetation is also different place. So if you really look into this scatter plot, you can argue that um, that uh, snow and ice can have a unique space uh, so that we can identify snow uh, very uh, comfortably on satellite images. So having said that, let us understand what we want to do. So you take a uh, uh, you take a uh, characteristics of the VIP sensor, uh, which is in IRS P, uh, P6 satellite, and you see, look into the into its characteristic of sensor. We have to realize one thing very clearly that algorithm is developed for satellite sensor, so it is not developed arbitrarily for any other thing. So in order to do that, we have to have a certain a characteristic of that sensor. So in this particular case, we are looking into the AVIF sensor uh, of IRSP6. So you can see the first important thing is ground sampling distance. It generally means the spatial resolution of ground. So uh, it is very, um, uh, if you look into this, um, the sensors, uh, across the track and along the track. So along the track means it is in in the direction of which satellite is moving and across the track means the perpendicular by which satellite is moving. So it has a two, um, uh, if you really look, look into the across the track, it has a 56 meter spatial resolution at Nadir. Nadir is the point which is exactly downstream from the uh, uh, from the uh, satellite and 70 meters off Nadir. Off Nadir means if you really look into swath of satellite, which is 740 meters, so extreme end of swath. So, at the, so if you take Nadir at middle, so you have around 370 and 370 kilometers both the side and 370 kilometers from Nadir, you will have 70 meters of spatial resolution. So you have a 56 meters at Nadir, you have a 70 meters of Nadir, which is at the extreme end of your uh, swath. And then you have 66 meter integration time. Uh, and that means when it is satellite is moving in the direction and if it collects the data within 9.9 .9 milliseconds, then it will have 66 meter in uh, uh, meter spatial resolution. Because if it is not able to do within that milliseconds, then it is possible that you might have gap. So uh, you have 
66 meter, which is so you have a three different spatial resolution. So, but many of you would have used the AVIF sensor, uh, and you will always say it is a 56 meter spatial resolution. You never get this idea that it has a three spatial resolution. But eventually, when it is given to user, you integrate this uh, or resample the entire data and give you special resolution of 56 meters. Uh, in a process, you are going to make cert certain compromises on your radiometry. You have to be very clear about this. Uh, and um, so up to that extent, uh, the original uh, radiation characteristics will be slightly modified as we go on resampling. In addition to that, there's also SWAT, which I was talking about, is a 740 meter SWAT of satellite. So at a given time, satellite can measure, uh, uh, measure, make observation for 740 kilometers. Then it has a four spectral bands. It has 0.52 to 0.59, one spectral band, 0.62 to 0.68, another spectral band, 77 to 86, another spectral band, 1.55 to 1.7 is a third um, uh, spectral band. But what really important is, is the quantization. Uh, so that is, it has a 10 bits quantization and probably now it has, at that time, is a P6. Uh, at that time it was 10, it might have gone up now in a latest AV sensor. So quantization is very important because it provides you opportunity, but a small change in reflectance, how many pixels you will have to detect those. So quantization or dynamic range in that sense is very important for us. So the radius setting, that means uh, it is also very important. So band two have a 53 uh, uh, microwatt per centimeter per steradian per micro. It, that means it is 100% albedo. That means if incoming solar radiation will be 53, and if 100% it is reflected, then it is. Um, uh, so you, it is a maximum you expect um, that this much radiation is be, will be received by satellite. Mm, and B3 is a 47, uh, B4 is 31.5, and B5 is 7.5. 7 so it also depends upon how much solar radiation is coming from the sun on the ground surface uh, and how much is solar radiation is emitted by the sun depending upon that mm, it is it is done uh, but don't be under impression that when you go to the next slide you can see you can have actually incoming radiation which much more slightly higher than this also so it is possible in certain circumstances so what it means? It means that in a band two, if satellite sensor receives more than 53 uh, by, by milliwatts per centimeter square, then it will get saturated. So if it receives 54, 55, 56, 60, 61, it will show only as a 53. That is how this radial setting. Satellite sensors can have a multiple radial setting. But those who are operating satellites never like this idea of using multiple satellite setting because that is something has to be moved into the satellite from Earth. And it is quite possible that they can mess up with because then it becomes a mechanical operation. It may, may succeed partially. It may succeed. It may not succeed. And because of that, it can create the problem. So multiple settings are there, but there's extreme reluctance from those who are operating satellites to use those facility. But in this particular case, this is the one which is commonly used. Then you have band to band registration is plus minus 0.25. What it means is um, there will be shift. Once we have band two, band three, band four, band five, they should actually support them both exactly you know, each other. But you can have some error into that and that is reflected into this. So having said that, uh, we have looked into the uh, spectral reflectance 
of AB sensor, band 2 and band 5, and we know that band 2 has a very high reflectance for snow, and band 5 has very uh, low reflectance. So you convert this into normalized difference, so, and that is called normalized difference snow index. Idea behind normalized difference snow index is you have a numbers which are manageable. That means if you take only ratio, numbers could be very large or you will find very difficult to put the threshold. But in this particular case, um, one moment you normalize, you can have a minus one to plus one uh, uh, number. And because of that, this is a commonly used. Uh, and if this particularly bank two and if you, you can change combination and uh, this thing is also called uh, something else. You can do it for vegetation uh, or you can do it for water. You can do normalized water uh, uh, index or you can call it NDVI, normalized difference vegetation index. So this is called normalized difference no index. Uh, so because it, it uses spectral characteristics of. Uh, so uh, if you really look into this, this work is done by one of my doctoral students um, who is now a very senior scientist in the DRDO. So you can see that how NDSI, uh, if you take the spectral band, uh, AVIFS, that means uh, we know the spectral band of AVIFS is, is uh, 0 0.5 to 0 0.9 and 1.55 to 1.7. If you take the spectral band, and try to develop the uh, NDSI, how it looks like. So first look at the mm, uh, first look at the reflectance of these objects. So uh, reflectance of this object is, uh, if you see the AVIF sensor, the spine has around. Okay, so now we were uh, talking about the uh, spectral reflectance of um, of uh, various land features because this observation was done in Dhundi Observatory uh, in Himachal Pradesh in Manali uh, and the doctoral work of Dr. Negi who is currently in Snow and Avalanche Study Establishment. So uh, what, um, what you can see here is how, how is, um, um, how is the spectral reflectance curve. If you can see a band two, which is 520 to 509 nanometer, then you can see that how much is the reflectance is 0.49 is the reflectance in pine deciduous, 0.82 is wet snow, very high wet snow, 0.76, and water is 0 0.52. So you can see here how different land features as a different spectral reflectance. So you can remember, look here that wet snow and very wet snow, even though at snow changes from wet to high wet snow, there is a reduction in snow albedo. That also you can see. Um, so uh, what it can say is, and if you look into the band five, uh, which is a, a sweet band where we're supposed to have low reflectance, you can see here wet snow has 0 0.041 and high wet snow has a lower 0 0.016. So as it changes, um, it is a quite significant reduction in reflectance takes place. So if you look into the NDSI, if you use this reflectance curve, reflectance numbers, and you convert it into NDSI, you can see here is point, uh, minus 0.46 is pine minus 0.716 uh, is uh, deciduous forest, uh, then wet snow is a 0.94, then very high high wet snow is 0.95, water is 0.96, and cloud is 0.226. What it means is that you have a confusion between the water and snow. But other land features such as pine, deciduous, or cloud can be, or vegetation can be uh, separated from this, and but water and snow can still have a confusion. But it is also for us important to understand that uh, 
so we have ability now to look into the unique. Uh, we have ability to look into the unique reflectance um, uh, characteristics and convert it into normalized different snow index, and we can map a snow easily. Um, however, uh, there could be a confusion or mixed pixel of water. What to do with that? We will look. That is the purpose of also algorithm. We will look into that um, very uh, later stages. So before that, it is important for us to understand we should get the correct reflectance as well as uh, correct NDSI values. If incoming solar radiation is contaminated by various other features, we should have ability to separate out so that we can get the correct terrain um, parameters uh, from that our correct reflectance of the terrain. So we know that uh, this is a sun and sun's radiation. Um, when once it enters into the atmosphere, it gets attenuated. And when it gets attenuated, that means um, it, is, it is scattered and it, it reflects in all directions. So it is quite possible. Uh, this is a sensor uh, where it receives the solar radiation, incoming solar radiation. It is quite possible that some of the uh, uh, scattered radiation from the atmosphere can go up and enter into the, our sensor. So uh, you have this atmospheric scattering phenomena and because of radiation reaching to that. So that is known as path radiance. So we should have ability to identify how much of the path radiance is coming so that we can get correct reflectance of uh, surface. The once radiation is incident as it's fallen on the surface it reflects and it reflects uh, uh, into the atmosphere and uh, energy transmission it passes through the trans uh, transmission and reaches to the sensor so we have you have but how much is terrain element that is important it depends also on bi-directional reflectors function it is a mathematical dis description of how reflectance varies for all combination of illumination and viewing angles of given length layer. So what really happens is as season changes, sun's position um, is changing. Is uh, Even though you may take satellite uh, observation at one time at 10.30 or 10 o'clock uh, or 11 o'clock, whatever may be your uh, standard time, because that has to be set into the sun synchronous orbit, uh, uh, but with the season, sun's position is going to change. In addition to that, terrain is not also uh, uh, is a uniform. It is the undulating terrain. So uh, sun uh, sun angle, incident rate angle angle will change um, depending upon uh, the position of terrain. That means it's a, it's a slope angle and orientation angle. We will look into this issue subsequently. So. This is a mathematical of all these aspects when you come together, you call the bidirectional function. We will not go much depth into that. But key question is, uh, how do you estimate uh, the radiance from the digital number? So what it means is, um, a digital number is nothing but it depends upon quantization or, or it depends upon the uh, how much is uh, if you look into the uh, sensor characteristics it is only function of quantization how many bits is the data so if it is a two bit three bit four bit five bit ten bits so it, depending upon that whatever the incoming solar radiation it receives if it receives from um, uh, 50 uh, so it it is split into uh, 10 raised to power minus uh, 2 raised to power 10 that is a quantization, that is how it is split into that. So uh, this is just a, a number. It doesn't reflect, it doesn't tell you about the uh, how much is energy is reflected from the surface um, and how much radiance. So that is called radiance. Radiance is the energy which is, um, uh, which is reflected from the surface. So the digital number uh, needs to be converted into radiances. Um, so digital number is uh, so you there, there's a, some uh, procedure for calibration procedure for that. And you have 
uh, before you send the satellite into the orbit, you have a, a calibration of sensor. That means if you have a minimum, uh, minimum should be zero, but it is, uh, you take at the minimum and the maximum, uh, how much is uh, a spectral radius, and then it, you have a digital number. So if you have 250 digital number, you convert this into, uh, you create this slope, and this slope is used to convert digital number into radiance. What it means is, mm, uh, so slope, uh, G slope is a response function, and B is the intercept of response function. So B is here, that means it should be at zero, but instead of that, it is you have some value added in it. Where. So you have L minimum is a spectral radi radiance. So, uh, so if you want to have L lambda, uh, which is nothing but the uh, radiance, then you have L maximum, L maximum, uh, L minimum and L maximum. L maximum is a spectral radiance at D and uh, uh, maximum, how much is the minimum, which is generally zero. The bias or calibration set off, this is a bias or calibration set off, and then uh, L, uh, you add this value L minimum here, and you get the radius number. You will do some of those exercises uh, in a due course during this, uh, this during this course also. So, mean solar, what essentially you do is, uh, you try to do it uh, initially that uh, above the atmosphere because uh, you receive the um, uh, ref uh, energy above the atmosphere because satellite is above the atmosphere. And then, um, then what you do is the incoming solar radiation, you know how much is above atmosphere, how much you received above the atmosphere and try and get it being uh, reflectance, uh, which is exoatmospheric atmospheric reflectance above the atmosphere. So mean solar exoatmospheric spectral irradiance. So now we are talking about another sensor, which is IRS 1C and 1D satellite, and it has at least three weaves uh, um, and uh, IRS, this is IRS 1C and 1D, and it has a different spectral band, band 2, 3, 4, 5, and it has if you really look into these sensors, what I wanted to show you is, you understand how much is uh, incoming solar radiation is there. Uh, and you can see here is incoming solar radiation in least three, in band two is 185 uh, milliwatt per centimeter per steridian per micron, but its saturation is 14. That means if uh, maximum radius it can measure is uh, is uh, maximum radius and, and it is percentage. So maximum radius is a 14 and it percentage wise it is a 36 percent. So if total incoming solar radiation uh, which is um, is X then 36 percent of that at which the sensor will get saturated. What it means is that a satellite receives in band two any radiance or any energy which is more than 14 microwatt, it will get saturated and it will show only 14. So it means 14, above 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20 will show as a 14. Same thing you can see other. Key question is why it is done in this fashion because some of the uh, land objects for which this sensor was launched has very low reflectance. And because of that, if they have low reflectance, so they, they reflect very small amount of energy to make sure that uh, you get a large number of dynamic range in this small amount of energy, you do this thing. So that is how it is done, but uh, you cannot do a, a remote sensing application, uh, particularly for snow, by using this sensor because every time it gets saturated. So the radius setting you can see in A, B, C, the 53, whereas it is in list three was 14. So it was really very low and uh, uh, we have really uh, difficulty in doing that. So if you look into the dynamic range, how it works out as list three has seven bit data and it has 128 pixels you can have. 
and AVIF has a 10 bit data and it has a 1024 um, pixels. So, what it means is mm, originally, when early days uh, in uh, 90s and early, early days, uh, there was limitation of technology and they were not able to download the data in a speed because of that the data is reduced and that is how work was done. But uh, somehow uh, the work on glaciers, if you look into the some of our earlier papers, we were not really working much on uh, on albedo and other kind of work essentially because it was at that time satellite data was not really allowing us to do that kind of work. Um, so uh, what really happens is on above the surface, but what happens on the land? That is very important thing. Um, so, our, our, our even, so this is the estimation of reflectance form from radiance. So once you have radiance, you need to convert it into uh, reflectance. So in order to do that, reflectance of pixel in a particular band, you, you have this formula by which D is the Earth, Sun Earth distance, E Sun is the mean solar exoatmospheric spectral reflectance. We have seen that. We have seen some of the um, uh, this exoatmospheric reflectance we have seen here, this much is reduced coming from the sun, we know that, and cos theta s is a zenith angle. So what it means is, um, it gives the two crucial parameters. One parameter is giving how uh, sun earth distance, as it is an astronomical unit, as we move from uh, mean as sun is uh, Earth is tilted, it might vary minor here and there, so that is also influencing your result. And mean solar uh, reflectance is not changing much, and this is giving solar zenith angle. Um, so, uh, and this is the cause of that, because it, it reduces with the cosine. So you use the cosine of uh, theta s, and this means, um, what it means? It means if surface is not perpendicular to radiation, the radiation per unit area is reduced by cosine of solar zenith angle. Remember, uh, I will try to explain to this. But remember this, this, if surface is not perpendicular, if surface is inclined, uh, uh, is, and then its incoming solar radiation uh, is reduced by co cosine of zenith angle. So let us understand what it means. It means that <coughs> So you have horizontal plane over here, where uh, it is horizontal, and you have sun, and sun is and sun is uh, is uh, making certain angle with vertical, which is a theta s. Mm -hmm. So incoming solar radiation e into cos theta s. So this theta s is reducing uh, incoming solar radiation. Uh, if um, had been vertical, there is a different story, but this is theta s, it is using E cos theta s. Uh, but if surface is not, this is a horizontal surface, if surface is inclined, and if it is making angle of theta o, this is angle of theta o, and this is uh, this is a vertical, uh, equal, uh, and then this is a theta s, which is angle which is made from vertical, and this is a perpendicular, for that, so actually the uh, the angle between the perpendicular is a theta i. Eh? So uh, theta s becomes theta o plus theta i. So incoming solar radiation is e cos theta i. That is uh, uh, that is what how it will change, and uh, because of that, it depending upon angle and depending upon orientation, it is quite possible that incoming solar radiation will change. And that incoming solar radiation is significantly going to affect uh, its reflectors. <coughs> it is not the reflectance of snow has changed, but your observation has apparently changed the reflectance. Um, you understand? So you take, this is a curve. Uh, this is work which is also done for one of the doctoral thesis. And you can see this is a reflectance and this is a direction in which it is. Suppose you have 10 degree slope and you have, then you have a reflectance. Uh, if it is northern facing, it is 0.4. And 
and if it is southern facing, it is 0.8. Uh, so it appears to be it has very high reflectance. So this is how reflectance is going to change uh, very significantly depending upon its orientation as changes in slope. Even in northern slope, 10 degree, 20 degree, 30 degree, 40 degree, depending upon slope uh, in in a an angle can also significantly change depending upon the direction it can change. So it has a both way effect. If you look into all things, this is a both has the effect. Some places it is reducing, some places it is increasing, increasing around the slope angle. So this is very um, that means. If you really want to work on reflectance, you have to work on this very different, this idea that is you need to correct satellite uh, reflectance for local illumination angle. So this is known as, theta i is known as local illumination angle. So you need to correct it for local illumination angle. And top of that, we have seen the two aspects. One aspect is, Path radiance, you need to correct it. Path radiance, uh, uh, and you need to correct it for local illumination angle. So you have a complex work to do if you really want to work, uh, get the true reflectance of snow. So key question is, can we really get rid of all this complex issue and try to simplify it? Uh, this is one of the our paper we published way back 2010. You can see here is now this is a slope which is a uh, where it is uh, sloping in north direction and ABIP sensor has 0.5 and it has 0 0.017 reflectors in band 5. If you see it is uh, west then uh, sloping or south sloping you can say 0.85 and 0 0.1. Even though there's a large variation in reflectance, there is no difference in NDSI. This is a unique characteristic of NDSI. And why this is happening? I will leave to you. You do simple mathematical calculation and you can do it. So this is a, this is a great step forward in simplifying our procedure and our work uh, so that we can quickly get the snow cover uh, without uh, doing too much calculation on local illumination angle or path radiance, irrespective of you can do. So uh, you can see that uh, there are a lot of variation in reflectance uh, in band 2 and 5, but NDSI values are really within 0.5 and uh, 9.7, um, and that variation possibly because of um, possibly because of the, the way experiment was set up. Uh, I, I have not shown you experimental setup, but this was a very unique experimental setup. Uh, we have done thank to the people working in snow and avalanche study establishment at that time, which has created a special platform for us so that you can move the uh, you can move the platform to ensure that we get the reflectors. Uh, we can put a lot of snow on that platform and keep on rotating the platform. So that's this orientation and direction keep on changing. So it was really very creative time at that in those days. And uh, we did it and you can see now this can be done. Uh, so another question is uh, we need to validate it. Uh, really that field validation of NDSI for different land features. So you have band two and band five, which we are supposed to use for NDSI. So we have done it for uh, fresh moist snow, refrozen fresh snow, high wet snow, uh, then clean snow under shadow, and uh, moist. Uh, so this aspect, I would like to dwell a little bit about the shadow concept. So what really happens is when you do satellite interpretation, particularly in a region such as Himalaya, and if you are taken satellite images around 10 o'clock, then you have a mountain shadow. So uh, and since it is in mountain shadows, um, if you use the ordinary technique by which you do the classification, the reflectance or uh, radiances are very different and making it very difficult to identify snow under mountain shadow. But if you really look into that, uh, it is uh, 
NDSI is also very high here in mountain shadow. So one of the um, uh, one of the key application of this not only it simplifies the procedure, but also it has ability to monitor snow under mountain shadow. And why is that? Uh, that is essentially because mountain shadow does not mean it doesn't receive any radiation. It, rec it doesn't receive direct radiation, but it always receives the diffuse radiation. And because of that, um, you have some radiation there. You can see the radiance is very low. So weight southern facing have 36 uh, milliwatt. It has only 0.83, but still it has. It is not zero. And that is helping us to get the, uh, uh, that is helping us to get the reflector. So it is a unique uh, feature. Uh, if you see now that we can, uh, you can get rid of local illumination angle. You can get rid of path radiance and you can get rid of shadows. So it is, looks to be very promising uh, technique uh, by which we can develop it. So you normally all remote sensing people will do is first plot the scatter, scatter plot to show how NDSI and reflectance band two you can see. So you can see very clearly here vegetation is marked here, rock is here, fog is here, cloud is here, shadow, snow is here, snow under shadow is there and water is there. So if I put arbitrarily 0.4, as a as a as a as a value uh, at threshold where if snow is above 0 0.4 uh, or NDSI is above 0 0.4 I will call it as a snow and if NDSI is less than 0 0.4 I will call it as a non-snow so I will give non-snow zero and I will give give snow one but having do that there are two questions are important why to select 0.4 uh, why not 0 0.5, why not 0 0.3? And another question is what you do with the water? Uh, because water, uh, still you identify water as the snow in this algorithm. So this is very important for us to understand and we will try and dwell on this issue uh, in the next uh, couple of minutes. So another key issue is also your pixel uh, may not be a, a pure pixel. Uh, what it means is uh, uh, if you take the satellite, so pixel might have partly snow, it might have partly vegetation, it might have partly a rock. So what you do with that, the mixed pixel. So this is another experiment was carried out and there are a lot of publication on this. You can see that if a pixel is without vegetation, you have no problem. In the mixed vegetation, the one fourth pixel is uh, is of vegetation, one half pixel of vegetation, then NDSI values come uh, coming down. Still, you can under three fourths part of vegetation, you can still identify snow, uh, uh, that pixel as a snow, or vegetation, if it is full, then you cannot. So, in that sense, NDSI is a robust, um, a robust uh, algorithm or method by which uh, we can really identify snow very clearly even if it is a mixed pixel in that sense. So I want to understand what is the thrush value uh, of this. Uh, so uh, so you do the uh, sensitivity analysis to understand whether it should be 0 0.4, 0 0.5, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8. I don't know what it is. So what you do? What you do is you take a region uh, which is a predominantly covered by snow. Uh, and uh, of course, it will have small amount of vegetation land and other features, but it is a predominantly snow. And try and do change uh, its um, threshold values. So you start with 0.1, um, then say how much is area. You change it to 0.2, you see how much change in area, percentage change in area you calculate. You go to 0.3, you go to 0.4, you go to 0.5. Like that you go and then you see where is that threshold is, where, from where this slope, from where we start losing the land, land. It means that is the point from where we start losing the snow. Uh, so that should be threshold value. So this is very close to 0.4. From here the curve is started to lose certain line, uh, uh, certain pixels, and we call 
so that is how you can do it. It can vary from season to season. I, you must take it from me. And uh, it can you can go. Uh, so as a conservative estimate, people have taken 0.4. Um, but you can do this experiment in your own uh, way and try and analyze and do it. What is the 0.4? Is it is correct? 0.45 is correct. Many people have used fine tune this for debris cover or numerous other things. You can you can do it in that fashion. So when you do that, you can do that. Uh, so this is a bit sensor. So let us look into this. How it looks like? We have said we have two uh, ideas. One idea is uh, we have. This is where mountain shadows are. You can see there's a, a spot is there mountain shadow. We can clearly identify on this snow uh, in mountain shadow. So that is not a problem. Mountain shadow is not a serious problem. Then another issue comes as a as a as a, uh, this is where clouds are there. So what do you do with the clouds? Uh, this is a really a million dollar question and there are no easy answers if you are using only NDSI is a characteristic in the future. If you use thermal or any other data, then it is slightly different ball game. If you NDSI, it has two problems. One problem is um, uh, you can uh, identify if you have thermal band and other band, you can identify cloud uh, clearly, but our idea, our algorithm is not about the mapping cloud. We want to know what is below the cloud. Is it snow, whether it is vegetation or whether it is a rock. And that is where the difficulty comes is you know, there are some algorithm by which you can clearly mark the cloud, but what is the below the cloud? is can lead to the a lot of confusion and difficulty in doing that. So uh, we have uh, then we have to uh, algorithm has to be standardized because algorithm cannot be um, just uh, left as it is and you cannot do the experiment every every given day on that on each because you receive every five day the satellite image is 700 kilometers. You have entire mountain range. So practically you are getting three images per day. You need to analyze it and get the result. Whatever errors are there that these errors uh, uh, should be known for what reason they are coming and they cannot vary from, pic uh, from pixel to pixel or imagery to imagery. So having said that, this is how that finally algorithm is, um, is fixed. Uh, you can ask certain philosophical questions on this, but let me explain to you how this was fixed uh, at that time. And I'm still under impression if you get um, it, this was done way, way back in uh, 2005, six or something like that, seven. And if you go back, still probably they are producing um, snow map by using this algorithm, but you need to check with ISRO. So this is ABIF data. You take band two and band five. From there, you convert the reflectance image. From reflectance image, you get the normalized different snow index image. And if it is greater than 0.4, then it goes as a snow and water. Correct? Uh, then if it is less than 0.4, then it is goes as greater than 0.4, then it goes as a cloud pixel and between 0.4 and 0. And if it is less than 0, then it is other pixels. So you remove the cloud pixel and you do nothing with that. Just remove the cloud pixel. Correct. And then you take other pixel, which is less than 0. Then what you do? Or, or this, no, sorry, this cloud pixels will go into this N5. So you take that. So you do one thing. You have, you take the previous imagery, which is a five days before you have acquired now. And here also you develop NDSI image and you use this thing. And with the idea in this is 
um, that <clears throat> whatever pixel is identified as a non snow pixel will go through it again uh, the on satellite images which is five days earlier than today so if it is a 10th if today is uh, if it is a 10th march imagery we are analyzing then we go and a certain pixel either identify 10 as a snow they will go at snow certain pixel identified as non-snow they go to the fifth um, march imagery again and identified as a snow and non-snow pixels and with the idea that within the five days the cloud will be shifted and then we have and then we have uh, uh, we uh, we have this imagery so difficulty is now in uh, abyss data uh, uh, is a water pixel so what you do with a uh, with a water pixel is very difficult thing because mm, it is a much more tricky question to answer because it is question has to be answered on philosophical level. What it means is you have a water body. It is much easier for us to take a water body uh, in a summer time and remove that water body from the mass by using mass. It is one easiest way to do it. Second difficulty is that is that water in winter time will freeze and there will be then snow on the ice so whether you want to estimate that as a snow or you don't want to estimate as the snow so a difficulty is there and whatever may be the your decision some people you are going to make happy some people you are going to make unhappy so uh, if you are a hydrologist uh, you would like uh, remove those things because that is not going to produce water into the river system. Um, and if you are a pure scientist, you will say, OK, we are not monitoring whether snow is on land or snow is on ice. We are monitoring snow. If you take the glaciers, you, you monitor snow on glaciers also. So why not on, on ice, uh, ice body? So you, you take a call. Everybody has to take a call on that, whatever they want to do. Uh, there is no silver bullet answer for this question. So uh, this is how you do, and then you have a 10 daily basin-wise maximum snow cover. Why is that? <coughs> Why is that? Because once you identify any pixel as a snow pixel, you are not going to examine that pixel again. This is a lacuna of this algorithm that you are not visiting that pixel again. It means this pixel will be identified as a snow pixel. So in the 10 days time, if some pixel have got converted into from snow to non-snow, it will not be depicted here. Therefore, it is maximum uh, snow cover. So this work, you can remove the cloud and this is how NDSI image on product you can see it was done and this work was done from 2005 to 2009 till i was leading this this program that monitoring of seasonal snow with large number of basins and i'm sure many of you some of you might have also worked uh, might be working still in this program this is still ongoing program to monitor seasonal snow in isro there is also validation program where you can it is much easier you match uh, the pixels, this is a classical way of validating the algorithm that also you can do. You can also validate in a, a very uh, different way. Mm. Uh, what, it, what this way is, this is opportunistic validation. What it means is you take a geographical land and historically you identify this region in the predominant is 100% snow cover. There is no other uh, landform there. You take the satellite images, which is of uh, non-snow season, summer season, and classify this into different categories. You categorize is a snow and ice, barren land, sparse vegetation, dense vegetation. Uh, you know, identify this, create a mask, and just wait. Wait, wait, wait. Huh? Till you get 
major snowstorm in that region, right? And you have, and moment you have a major snowstorm, uh, this satellite has a five-day repetitivity. So uh, if you are lucky, you will get the next day satellite images. You have satellite images, then you do the classification, and then say how many pixels they are actually supposed to be there, but how many are identified as a snow. So that is how you get the accuracy. So this is how snow and ice accuracy is 99.6%, barren land 98%, sparse vegetation 98%, dense vegetation 65%. So that is how it looks like there is a slight change in uh, depending upon vegetation and other things. So you can see that this is also that. The, another thing is the cloud, um, that how cloud cover can really uh, influence the uh, your result you can see this is how the uh, cloud uh, this all variation uh, in uh, accumulation melting accumulation melting this is you may tend to interpret but this is only because of the uh, difficulty of cloud cover but if you remove that then you can get much smoother curve and you can also do when you remove all cloud and um, uh, and then the snow accumulation ablation pattern you can get one is for Ravi Basin, which is low altitude basin, and you can see even the middle of winter snow is melting. And if you see the Bhaga Basin, which is very high altitude basin, and it is melting in the beginning of winter, but it is really stable snow cover in the middle of winter. So this kind of use, you can use it later on for hydrological purpose and other things. So before I close this presentation, I would like you to you to go through some of these questions and try to answer yourself. I will not answer this question. So can we estimate NDA size in digital number? Uh, if yes, why? If no, why? Just dwell on it based upon our today's presentation. Why reflector changes in different slope and orientation? Why NDA size do not change on different slopes and orientation? That is also, I have not answered this question, but I'm sure by with this presentation, you should be able to answer. Why we should use normalized difference than ordinary ratio? Try and do something on your own to, to answer this question. Why cloud gives the error in snow cover estimation? Can we use the temperature threshold to improve accuracy? Can we estimate the snow under mountain shadows? And can we estimate snow under vegetation? These are the questions. I think you should uh, dwell upon this and uh, yeah, thanks a lot. Uh, this was when I was much younger and uh, this was way back in 2004, photograph at Patsy Glacier. So 